is taken from Lamentations chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. And if you have one of the Red Church Bibles, it's on page 823. So Lamentations chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. How deserted lies the city once so full of people. How like a widow is she, who was once great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night, tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, there is no one to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her, they have become her enemies. After affliction and harsh labor, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells among the nations. She finds no resting place. All who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed festivals. All her gateways are desolate, her priests groan, her young women grieve, and she is in bitter anguish. Her foes have become her masters. Her enemies are at ease. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Her children have gone into exile, captive before the foe. All the splendor has departed from daughter Zion. Her princes are like deer that find no pasture. In weakness, they have fled before the pursuer. In the days of her affliction and wandering, Jerusalem remembers all the treasures that were hers in days of old. When her people fell into enemy hands, there was no one to help her. Her enemies looked at her and laughed at her destruction. Let us pray. The title of something really gives you a clue to its contents, doesn't it? If you watch, just sitting at home one evening and you watch EastEnders, uh, a few groans there. Uh, there are, unsurprisingly, a lot of people from the East End, isn't it? <laughs> Talking about apples and pears and pearly kings and queens. But if you flick channels and find Emmerdale Farm, there is a vast reduction in the number of cockneys, uh, but a lot more sheep. It's called Emmerdale Farm. What do you expect? Or if you set off for London's glittering West End and you see Phantom of the Opera you can expect to hear lots of squawky operatic singing and a person dressed up as a phantom with a mask on. It's called Phantom of the Opera Friends. What did you expect? And if you go a little bit further up Shaftesbury Avenue to see Les Miserables, uh, be assured you won't come out feeling less miserable, but more miserable. <laughs> the clue is in the title, friends, Les Miserables. And the book that we leap in today does exactly what it says on the tin. The Book of Lamentations is, shock horror, a book of lamentations. Last week, if you are here, we looked in the first week in our series, we looked at a psalm of lament. And the Book of Psalms dedicates actually a huge space to these poems of lament. But lamentations is the full treatment, literally the A to Z of suffering. We're only actually going to dip into this book in the short series we're doing, so we're briefly kind of overview how it all holds together. And then over the next three weeks, we're going to just sort of zoom in on some key areas. The book itself consists, and it's worth having it open if you haven't got it, because if you're like me, you won't be very familiar with it. Uh, five poems written by an anonymous author. Some would argue that it's the prophet Jeremiah. It's fairly, fairly likely, but it's never explicitly stated. Uh, we do know what, what the author is lamenting about. We know why he's doing it. They're reflecting on the exile that followed the Babylonian defeat of Jerusalem in 587 BC under King Nebuchadnezzar. And it's an account that you'll see detailed in 2 Chronicles 36. Remember the history of it. You've had the heady days of King David and King Solomon. Israel's divided into two kingdoms, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Israel first fell prey to a, oh, a glut of evil kings, that, that slowly and surely led them away from God, and eventually they fell prey to the mighty Assyrians in 722 BC. Judah at this point should have seen that. They should have smelt the coffee and learned the lessons, uh, but they didn't. They survive a bit longer, 
but an ascendant Babylon sort of rises to power after the collapse of the Assyrian Empire and its eyes are set on Jerusalem. Jerusalem that had been thriving. Not long before, there was a godly king, Josiah. He's led the nation through this great reform. Uh, But after his death, the nation sort of slipped into corruption and idolatry. The fall sort of came in stages, 605, 597. But it is in 587 BC that the destruction was total. Jeremiah warned and he prophesied and he was ignored. And we see it sort of summed up at the end of two chronicles uh, with the words that simply say, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. That's the end of 2 Chronicles. And that's the sort of background for the book. That's what's happening as this guy laments. And the laments serve a multiple of purposes. Uh, in, the, in them, the writer can sort of make a protest to others, even to God himself. And this sort of evocative language that we've already seen and that we will see uh, gives us sort of us a, a, a way of processing all that we're going through. Give us a voice, if you like, to some confusion that we feel, if we're honest, from time to time. And all the way through, it's, just, it's important to remember that it is part of the canon of Scripture. We can forget that sometimes when we're reading the words. And as such, it gives a real dignity, I think, to our suffering. It's not a sort of ungodly, hedonistic thing to cry out and lament, uh, but a sacred thing. There is a God-honouring way that we can respond to the deepest of tragedies, and there is a harmful way that we can respond to calamity. Laments, I've grown to believe, are much needed, but I think often ignored. And as we flick through uh, the book, by the way, I like that picture, good luck trying to read it, but (laughs) it's sort of like a wonderful picture, this of uh, of an overview of Lamentations. Chapters one to four, you'll see, they're fairly similar. (laughs) They're written in what's called an acrostic way, that's it, each verse starts with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet, starting with the first and going through, hence a very real A to Z of suffering. Uh, In chapter 1, we see the city personified as a woman, the Lady of Zion, and the poem speaks really of her shame and how there's no comfort for her. We're going to look at her today. Chapter 2 is more about the actual fall of Jerusalem, speaks about it being as the consequence of her sin. It speaks of God's wrath, not as a sort of volatile, blowing-off-the-handle kind of anger, but as a measured and patient justice. He's slow to anger, but the point is reached, uh, and Jerusalem has in so many ways violated her covenant. Chapter 3, the voice again. This time it's a suffering man, and he draws on other books of scripture as he expresses this lament. And this is also the part of the book which speaks of hope, probably contains the most famous verse, maybe the only verse that you'll know, or verses that you'll know from this book, chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, uh, which say, Because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That's the sort of the height of the book, hope-wise, uh, and we'll, we'll get there next week. It's as if the man is saying here, God, if you are consistent in your acting justly, as hard as that is for us at this time, then you will also be consistent in your faithfulness and mercy. That's the hope. Chapter 4, it's back to Jerusalem. It's sort of the siege of Jerusalem. And it's a poem about comparisons, really. What was Jerusalem like then and what's it like now? Lamenting then that the children laughed and played, but now they're begging for food, that the wealthy ate lavish foods, but now they're sort of scrabbling around for whatever. The leaders, once garbed in splendour, are all ravaged and ragged. Even the king is off his throne and captured, poignant today, maybe. So some very powerful comparisons in it, which takes us to the final chapter, chapter 5. And here, interestingly, that acrostic style, eight is just thrown out the window. Uh, it's no longer neat and alphabetical in this image, really, of grief exploding. 
And here, it's not the Lady of Zion, it's not the suffering man, it's the people who speak. It's a communal lament, a prayer for mercy. Uh, and that's where we sort of focus our time in two weeks' time. And for those of you who like a nice, neat ending to a book, uh, you know, Poirot solving the crime and tying up all those annoying little loose ends, uh, you'll be disappointed. Uh, there is a paradox as the book ends. If you look at chapter 5 and in the end here, chapter 5, uh, verse 19, uh, you, Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. So God is king. But, the next verse, the circumstances suggest that God is not there. Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us for so long? And the last verse, even that leaves things really unresolved. Restore to us yourself, Lord, that we may return, renew our days of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. And if, when I was reading that, I don't know if your Bible's got the same layout to me, that's right, is that right at the bottom of the page? I kind of thought, oh, what's this? I turned that, oh, Ezekiel. That's the end of it. That's the end of it. Um, and you think, well, what kind of end to a book of Scripture is that? But friends, I think there's power in this. Of course, there are other words of Scripture that resolve things. This doesn't offer a neat conclusion, which, of course, mirrors, doesn't it, some of our experience. Life isn't always nice and neat and tidy. So we hear Lady Zion lament and the suffering man speak and the people speak, but in the whole book, God doesn't speak. Heaven is not deaf or blind, but it is, in Lamentations, silent. Brings to mind the Lord Jesus himself when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Heaven's not deaf, but sometimes it can be silent. And it's a book that I hope will encourage us that lamenting is an important part of our journey of faith in a broken up and busted world. It can help us in times of national and personal disaster. So this week, we focus on chapter one where Lady Zion laments. And three words uh, that we may sometimes find ourselves crying out will hopefully frame our study here. And they are how, why, and please. And the first word we see is how, a word which I'm sure you've wailed out in a number of situations over the years. Um, look with me at verse 1. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. How like a widow is she, who was once great among the nations. Eka in Hebrew, where you get this word how, is, a, is really a guttural, guttural exclamation of lament. doesn't translate exactly. Another close word might be alas. It's a statement of shock but also with this element of questioning. It's our cry when we say, how has this happened? If you're here, you're rather half upstairs, cry out, how? You know something's gone terribly wrong if you hear that cried out from upstairs, don't you? And something's gone terribly wrong. In these first couple of verses, we have a city that was full and bustling and is now deserted. There is a weeping woman, but there's no one to comfort her. She's alone. There are tears on her cheeks. She's betrayed. Verse 3 arguably gets worse. Her people are in exile, taken captive. What had been rich and thriving is now desolate. In verse 4, even the roads cry out. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed festivals. Then verse 5 shows something that is really central to the pain. Look there, her enemies have triumphed. More than that, they've prospered. The blessing which should be theirs seems to have fallen to the enemy, and God, God has not intervened. I wonder if that resonates with anything in your experience. God, how? Alas, the Israelites must have felt this acutely. It's a complete reversal of fortune, thinking about it. I mean, if you look again at three, what might be conjured up in their minds when they consider the affliction and hardship 
Verse 3, after affliction and harsh labour, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells among the, the nations. And this, when you think of that, it relates to the Exodus times, more specifically the days before the Exodus, when the Egyptians at that time were crushing them with a yoke of affliction and harsh labour. And the story of Exodus has that terrible suffering, but capped with a wonderful deliverance. But here, after all the hardship of this decade of wrangling with the Babylonians this time, not the Egyptians, it hasn't ended in deliverance, but exile. How has this happened? How? And the response is to lament. Five times in that chapter, the phrase, no one to comfort. Five times we read of the sound of groaning. The priests groan in verse 4. The city groans in verse 8. All the people in verse 11. And Lady Zion herself in verses 21 and 22. But the most often repeated word in the chapter actually pointed out in Chris Wright's helpful commentary is all. All. The desolation is total. All her lovers all her friends, all who pursue, all her gateways, all splendour departed, all who honoured despise, all warriors, all enemies. And 22, a confession of all her sins, all her weaknesses exposed. Any hope of avoiding this devastation is gone. How, how? And from that shocked how leaps the more questioning why? Why? Now, this is another word you've probably screamed out from time to time. Why? Why has this happened to me? The very natural question, actually, in times of suffering, uh, it's asked here in our verses, you know, is this just fate? Is it a bit of an unlucky roll of the dice? Is it just what we should expect as humans? It's dog eat dog, law of the jungle stuff. Well, according to Lamentations, no. The first couple of chapters of Lamentations really do paint... I mean, it's a pretty unrelenting picture. And in verse 8 to 11, we get something of the reasoning for the destruction that the city has faced. This is not the answer to every calamity in Scripture. It certainly isn't the answer to every calamity necessarily in our lives. But it uncovers for us the reason that this city and nation at this time. Verse 8, Jerusalem has sinned greatly and so has become unclean. That's the reason now whatever has she done wrong what could be so terrible well we don't need to be terribly talented investigative journalists to get to the heart of that remember Jeremiah potentially the author well he was prophesying to the people for sure at this time his warnings go back decades he warned against alliances that of course failed he warned during the times of the deadly siege He warned of a dreadful famine. He warned of the fallen temple. Festivals that were once celebrated, forgotten. He warned. A little flavour of it from Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah 2, 5. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord? who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives. I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce, but you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. These laments, actually, are not just lamenting the desolation of the city. They are doing that as if that wasn't enough. They also lament the sinfulness of the nation. They're facing the judgment of God. The Lord has brought grief because of their many sins. The lament is for the suffering faced under her covenant Lord. Yes, they're a chosen people. 
the object of God's love, that this great kingdom has reached the tipping point. Well, friends, he is patient, but the time comes and God brings down his own temple, he scatters his own people, he makes desolate his own city. Those who ignored the warnings for so long, they thought they could play merry with his commands, pick and choose his laws, be dismissive as his rule. But the moment came where their sinfulness led to this brokenness. Why, they asked. Well, that's why. All that. The very people of God have abandoned their treasured worship of God. Not just what they do, but their very hearts. In their hearts, they've abandoned him. And friends, at this point, do we need to pause and say, Lord, I honour you and I want to bring before you my actions and my heart. Jeremiah introduces by the end of the, his book this hope that he would give his people a new heart, that they would fear him and not turn from him. It says this, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That is not what is in view at this time, but it would come a few hundred years later at the cross of Jesus where the gospel writers speak of a new birth from the inside out. I will give you a new heart. Friends, this picture of sin in verses 8 and 9 is evocative, but it makes such a powerful point. As we read this, it isn't just about Jerusalem, uh, but the wider rebellion that lies behind it, the ignored warnings, the missed opportunities to repent, to turn to him. And we must heed that this morning. You know, if we read this, if we read Lamentations and sort of somehow miss the reality of the huge problem of sin, then we've got a problem. How has this happened? Why has this happened? And now a please, a turning to God and a plea for his mercy. Uh, it's kind of interesting here, as the grief sort of overwhelms, the lamenter wants to ensure that everyone has heard uh, the appeals to God. They seem to be unheeded. So how about any passerby? I love this, throwing wider in verse 12. Uh, is, is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look around and see. Is any suffering like my suffering that was inflicted on me, that the Lord brought on me in the day of his fierce anger? Verse 13 feels like it's been, into, been sort of sent right into the lamenter's bones and net's been spread for his feet. Uh, but in verse 14 there is this recognition that this is from the sin and disobedience of God's people. A thread is being drawn between them. But perhaps the most galling of all is verse 21. Look at 21. People have heard my groaning, but there is no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my distress. They rejoice at what you have done. And their enemies celebrate this great loss as a victory. In fact, the first words that the writer puts into the mouth of Lady Zion are in verse 9. Look, Lord, on my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. And as we consider the hard words of the lament, as we hear Lady Zion appeal to us, might this be for us a spiritual wake-up call? Lament is a song that we need, and it is a song that we will sing all the while we live in a broken world cursed with sin. There is in them a sense of a longing for what will be, but is not yet. Friends, we, we need a lament, but a day will come when there will be no need for lament. Hallelujah that you won't have to sit through some series called Good Grief. And I'll tell you why. Because in Revelation we read it. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. 
But just for now, these words sound something of our present experience, don't they? And the lament here turns to a kind of plea. What is the plea? Well, we have to dig here a little bit, I think, but look with me from verse 18. Uh, Not only does she want God's ear, his attention, she pleads for his justice. Uh, Verse 18, the Lord is righteous, yet I rebelled against his command. Listen, all you peoples, look on my suffering. Uh, And then we sort of get her open confession. I, I rebelled against his commands. It's brought distress, torment, disturbance. Verse 20, see, Lord, how distressed I am. I'm in torment within. In my heart, I'm disturbed. I've been most rebellious. And so she pleads. She prays, verse 21, an interesting phrase, may you bring that day that you announced. May you bring that day you announced. And this is reference to the day of the Lord when he would judge. This is the day she wants Jerusalem to see. It's as if she sees this instrument that God justly uses against her today but will not escape his judgment tomorrow. That's the first plea, that God would do what he said he would do. And there's a second plea, I think, in verse 22. Let all their wickedness come before you. Deal with them as you have dealt with me. Because of all my sins, my groans are many and my heart is faint. This is not a a plea of innocence. She recognise her sin. This isn't a plea that God would dust over her sin. Come on, God, you know, turn a blind eye to mine, but go down heavy on theirs. it's, It's a plea for God to see all evil and not just hers. And friends, we have a great privilege as we read this. The passage is dark. We cannot sort of look at this book and then sort of try and fluff it up. But we can now shine on it the beautiful light of the gospel. We need to hear the hard lesson that sin is real, that it has devastating consequences. It's illustrated here. They may not be immediate, but they are real. We need to hear the hard lesson that there is justice and there is judgment But the gospel speaks of the beautiful grace and forgiveness that comes through the finished work of Jesus for all who turn to him. The cross of Jesus was necessary because of our sin and because of God's righteous judgment on all. Deal with them as you have dealt with me. And this will be so. And if you feel the power of this, the weight of it, oh friends, how much sweeter it makes the joy of turning to him and accepting that wonderful forgiveness that is offered by Jesus. His bearing of the weight of that, which we see as the book develops actually. Good grief. I'll be honest with you, and say, in the early days of planning this series, I don't know when it was, six weeks ago or something, I was looking through Lamentations and thinking, good grief, (laughs) what have I got myself into? Um, And this turning point for me came when I did, I thought, what do I do about this? How do I split it up? And I decided to read the lament all through in one go, out loud. And I offer this as potential homework to you all. I don't think many of you are going to take me up on it, but anyway, I offer it to you. Uh, I didn't do it at home for fear my family would think I'd gone bonkers. Uh, But one afternoon in the church, I knew there was nobody here, uh, and I lamented the book of Lamentations. I read aloud, and in a very Shakespearean and dramatic way, all five chapters, all the horror of it. And you know, I went from, in that moment, from why did we do this series, to I can't wait to start this series. Because after feeling the weight of this unarguably weighty book, how stunning to consider afresh the beauty of all that Jesus has done for me for you. It's not a shush it under the carpet forgiveness. 
oh yeah, let you off, Dave. But of putting on Jesus the weight of my sin, the weight of your sin, the weight of the whole world's sin, of him willingly taking it, not flinching. If you do that, it will surely open up your confession to him. Like Lady Zion, not trying to dust over your sin, but willy, willingly acknowledging it. And, of, and instead of saying, like here, Lord, will you deal with their sin as mine in your time, but being able this side of the cross to say, Father, forgive me. Thank you for making that sacrifice on my behalf. Thank you for saving me. What can I say? And so we end today with that cry of Lady Zion, verse 12. Is this nothing to you, all who pass by? Is this nothing to all you who pass by? On our world, it's so common for people to just pass by the cross, to barely even consider what claims it makes. Well, may we pause and hear a message of forgiveness of sin, of true peace with God, of everlasting life. Thank you for saving me. What can I say? Let's just have a quiet pause and then the band...